You are now officially enrolled in Hip Youth History, the coolest class online and on land. In today's lecture, Mr. Hughes will discuss Article 2 of the Constitution. Enjoy. Uh, hey, welcome to Hip Youth History, and I got a voiceover. A shout out to Thais. Pretty cool. In the next 20 minutes or so, guys, um, myself, Keith Hughes, and Noam Chomsky, my facilitator, are going to take you through part of the journey of your life. Not really. We're just going to go over Article 2 of the Constitution. But you need to know it. You need to know it because you're either a high school student and you need to pass that test. Maybe you're lost in college and you just kind of don't want to look silly in front of everybody. Or maybe you're going to a dinner party and they're going to be watching Jeopardy and you're just praying that uh, you know something about executive power. Or maybe you're just like really weird and you're lost and here I am talking to you. Either way, you're all welcome to Hip Hughes History. Let's look at uh, delegated power, qualifications, what's in Article 2, and flesh it out with some real-life examples. That would be great. Gnome, what do you think? Awesome! Awesome. Let's get started, guys. Ding dong, learning is here. Remember also that since using a film is part of a creative process, the steps you take reflect your own creative ability. So let's do it. Let's bang this guy up right now. So guys, let's look at presidential power, presidential requirements. We don't want to like, you know, kind of verbatim go over the Constitution, but we do want to generally get these big ideas out to you. So if we break up Article 2, and they break it up by sections and then clauses in Article 2, um, we can basically look in the beginning of Article 1, Section 1, where they talk about like who can be president and uh, how you get elected to be president in terms of the Electoral College. Really basic things. Um, you had to be 35. You still have to be 35, so kitties do not apply. You have to live continuously in the United States for 14 years, and you have to be a natural-born citizen. So, like, some really simple requirements that we've never had any problems with. Wink, wink, wink. That aren't crazy, but nevertheless, you should know that for sure. Faux show. You should also know that um, originally, the way the Electoral College works, and you can press another button if you want to learn all about the Electoral College, is that you know states choose electors, elections are run in those states, and then electors generally vote for who the states vote for, but they cast their ballots. And uh, originally, you would cast two ballots, and whoever came in second would be vice president. And that didn't meant that the people running for president you know, sometimes wouldn't get along as president and vice president um, if that um, was to occur. And that did occur in 1800 when Aaron Burr, who was in, uh, kind of an enemy of Thomas Jefferson, became his vice president mm. after Jefferson beat John Adams. Um, another kind of intricacy that you should know about in the Electoral College, and again, 1800 kind of shows this, is that um, if you think of the Electoral uh, College as like a pizza pie, and uh, in order to win the game, you have to get more than a half of the pizza pie. Well, today we understand that usually we have two people running for president. Like right now, we have a Barack Obama and we have a, what is this person's name? We have a Mitt Romney. Somebody's going to win half the pie plus one because there's two major candidates. But in the Constitution, it's set up where if nobody wins that majority... Um, hence, if you have more than two major candidates, then it's the House of Representatives that elects the president. It's an example of indirect democracy, ID, I call it. And that goes back to the Federalist Papers and factions and a whole bunch of other stuff. But generally speaking, you should know that. Um, in 1800, it was the House of Representatives that chose the president after, I don't know how many ballots they voted, but it ended up being Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> So basic, basic things like uh, Congress sets the election date, um, the Electoral College like we made reference to before. Um, but I think that's enough for the beginning because we have to get on. We have to move it on. Get out of here, Mr. Hughes. What are you doing? you got to teach the kids. Booyah. 
let's look at presidential power, guys. A few things about the president. The president is the enforcer of the law. It says in the Constitution they will faithfully execute the law, and of course, Congress delivers that law by signing, uh, by passing legislation in the House and the Senate. The president, you know, certainly has a bully pulpit, kind of this unwritten traditional idea that he proposes laws and, you know, he's kind of the leader of the country. And if Congress is of the same party as the president, many times they do work in unison. You know, think FDR and the New Deal. Most people don't associate the New Deal with the Democrats who passed it in Congress. They associate it with the president. And still the same if we look at uh, trickle-down economics and most people say, well, that was Ronald Reagan or that was George Bush. It was Congress that passed those laws of tax cuts that the president then signed. So the president can propose laws, use his bully pulpit, but at the end of the day, he has to execute the laws that Congress passes. Um, the president is commander-in-chief. That means that he basically runs the military. Um, one really important thing is the president does not declare war. <laughs> Congress declares war. Yeah. Yeah, boy. The president does not declare war. The president does not declare war. And uh, we have to go back, really, I think, to Korea until we get a kind of, I'm sorry, World War II, we get a, a congressional authorized war. Um, most actions taken by the president are under his guise of military commander-in-chief responding to issues of national security. So, for instance, if um, LBJ thinks that our interests are being attacked in North Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin, and he goes to Congress and asks for maybe even just a resolution to give him, you know, um, the, uh, the, the, the funding to go and, and bomb North Vietnam, that's not a declaration of war. Or if the aliens land and start eating babies' brains, um, we generally would like the president to, uh, you know, Call the military, you know, stop the baby eating brain scenario. And uh, we wouldn't need a declaration of war to do that. Um, certainly we should move on. There's a presidential power on my foot. Gonna pick it up. That's what I'm gonna do right now. Other things specifically you need to know, um, and you, there's a lot of checks and balances in here. So, you know, Noam and I can't explain these things without talking about Congress and sometimes the judicial branch. But certainly the president, sometimes I use one finger to kind of teach these concepts, like the president's commander-in-chief. The president signs things, right? He certainly signs laws. And uh, we should know in the lawmaking procedure that while he can propose them, he doesn't write them. But once he gets a written law on his desk, he then can either sign that law, and then, of course, it's the law of the land, or he can, one finger, veto that law. And then that law would get shipped back to Congress, where if they can override it with a two-thirds majority in both houses. But not necessarily an easy thing to do. So the president has tremendous power with that, that veto pen. Um, there's not a lot of ideas in Congress that are passed with two-thirds support. So if the president vetoes your idea, chances are it ain't going to happen. Um, the president also signs treaties, and um, this is another major check and balance. You do not want to give the power um, to, to, you know, basically make a friendship with another country for maybe decades to one person, you know, all by themselves. So if I give the power to sign treaties exclusively to the president, and the president wakes up one day possessed by, you know, an evil demon, and then signs a treaty with Satan, um, over the murder of all darkness and hell. Then you'd want the ability for the Senate to say, I don't think so. No! And that's what's in the Constitution in Article 1. The Senate will advise, I'm sorry, will give approval to treaties by two-thirds. So again, these kind of big things, like overriding vetoes or signing treaties, um, and we'll see in a few minutes that if the president's impeached, it takes two-thirds vote in the Senate to get the president removed from office. These are called super majorities because it's super important that we get it right. So, signing treaties. Um, sometimes I'll do that in class. Like, yo, you free. This is pardon power. And the president in Article 2 has the ability to admonish sentences, to basically blank out sentences, to get people out of you know, federal um, prison, or to make them immune from being charged with a crime. Um, you want an example? I got the best example ever. 
Um, you all know Watergate. Of course you know Watergate. What the hell's Watergate? Watch the video. But when Richard Nixon um, basically covered up a crime, didn't plan a crime maybe, but definitely covered up a crime, and uh, went against the, you know, um, the law of Congress by not turning tapes over, and basically could have been you know, maybe charged with a crime on the street. When he left the presidency, it was his vice president, now then the president, Gerald Ford, who pardoned Richard Nixon. And he might have kind of given himself kind of a scarlet letter to walk around with, saying, I'm the guy who let Nixon off, and maybe that's why he lost to Jimmy Carter in 1976. But nevertheless, presidential pardon power is really important. Um, and another presidential power, sometimes they go, I pick you. No, I pick you. No, I pick you. Is the power to pick Supreme Court and federal judges. Um, really, really important, um, and you learn this in the judicial branch section, but these are people that get jobs for lives their whole lives, like forever. Like if they were a vampire, they could be on the Supreme Court for like, you know, 800,000 years. I don't know if vampires live 800,000 years. Um, but nevertheless, really, really important thing. So we check and balance that as well. So anybody that gets chosen for a federal um, judgeship has to go to the Senate, and it's not a super majority, but they have to get 51%. The president also picks cabinet members. That's unwritten constitution. It's not specifically in the constitution, but also checked by the Senate. Um, really, really important powers. And um, let's review really quick so we get the major one down, um, and then we'll see if we can summarize and flesh out some other examples for you. So here we go. Get you. Originally, the president could serve unlimited terms. After Washington stepped down after two terms, it became an unwritten rule, until FDR broke that unwritten rule running four times and winning. The 22nd Amendment was ratified following FDR's death, officially limiting the president to two terms in office. We now bring you back to your historical lecture with Mr. Hughes. So it's the one-finger game. Come with me to the House of Learning. The president is the... Commander-in-Chief. The President can sign and he can sign, you did it. He can sign laws and he can sign treaties. Uh, make sure on the law segment you understand that he can also veto laws and those laws can be overridden. That veto can be overridden with two-thirds majority in both houses. And although the President can sign treaties, it has to be approved by the Senate by two-thirds. The President can do what to people? You he can pardon them. He can basically admonish their sentences, get them out of um, a federal prison situation. The president also picks who? That's right, he picks judges, right? And he also picks, or she would pick, cabinet members, and that's really important. The president enforces the law, um, and I think you got the major presidential powers down. And I think one of the lessons that you should have learned from this video is that the president doesn't have an extraordinary amount of power. A lot of the power that we see the president exercising comes from kind of the executive national security standpoint that, you know, we're going to learn in a second that he can suspend the habeas corpus in times as of crisis. Times as is not a word. So he certainly can use his power in national security to expand his power. And he's done that through executing the laws in ways that he sees fit. And we can have that discussion. There's going to be comments below that the president is just way too powerful outside the constraints of the Constitution nowadays. And there's other people that are going to argue that we need a forceful executive in order to get things done sometimes. Um, other things, the president can be impeached for sure. He can be kicked out of office. Um, we should all know no presidents have ever been kicked out. Zero. No. Zip. Never happened. That's important because many people think impeachment means removal from office, and it just doesn't. The House of Representatives can impeach the president for high crimes and misdemeanors, um, but they cannot remove the president. That is a two-thirds majority vote in the Senate. Again, that's a super majority, and it just goes round and round, guys. Checks and balances. Just an awesome game of checks and balances. So there you go, guys, executive power, constitutional executive power. Now look, has the office changed, and is there controversy, and drones in Pakistan, and what's going on, and yeah, absolutely. But in order to engage in that type of discussion, 
you need this constitutional kind of outline. So there you go, guys. We hope you join us again and again and again and again. Class is now officially over. Please gather your belongings and proceed to the next cool lecture by His Keys History. Subscribe today, and we'll see you for the next lecture. Bye.